Harris. I'm Madison, the youth pastor. I'm Caitlin, the kids director. And I'm Andrew, the worship pastor here at The Cause. This is your official two-minute warning. That's right. We are here to remind you that service starts in less than two minutes. So do us a favor and come into the auditorium to find your seats and get ready to worship with us. If you're joining us online, let us know in the comment section where you're from. We'd love to pray for you as we pray for our normal in-person tenders. We hope you've got your coffee and your Bible. Hey, we'll see you in about a minute and a half. Good morning, Cause Church. Can you stand to your feet, please? How are you feeling this morning? Did anybody respond? How, is you, how are you feeling this morning, Cause Church? Excited to be in the house of the Lord? Amen. Hey, wonderful, special, powerful things happen when we come together to worship the Lord. Amen. And so I want you to lift your expectancy with us this morning. And since we're together anyways, I want you to take a few minutes, get out of your chair, get out of your aisle, go say hello to somebody, meet somebody you don't know, shake a hand, go meet somebody. just came in. Why don't you meet somebody, shake a hand, move out of your aisle. It's all about community this morning. of a shout of praise this morning. Praise the Lord. I hope you can come expect the Lord to do amazing things today. Silence breaks in the name of Jesus as 
what you said you did. You will do what you said you will do. You are the firm foundation of our lives. So Lord, I come to give thanks. We come to give thanks and say you are the same yesterday, today, tomorrow, and forever. And we can trust in you. Lord, your completed work at the cross makes our spirit cry out to you. So today, Holy Spirit, would you come in this place? You're already here, but would you rest on us in this room? Pour out your spirit upon us, Father, in a new, fresh way as we worship you. We love you, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah. Oh, so good to see you guys this morning. Are you ready to worship the Lord today? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Well, he is here. We had a really powerful first service. And you know, the Bible says, we're two or three or more gathered. He's also there. Amen. Also, what we just did and what we continue to do is bring praise to his name. All right. I'll give, I'll give you $200 when we meet in heaven. Okay. To anybody that knows what the name Judah means. Remember, Jesus is a lion of the tribe of Judah. Hey, all right. I only said one person. I only have $200, okay? <laughs> Line of the tribe of Judah, that is Jesus. Judah means praise. That means that he is the king of it. He inhabits our praises. He lords over it. He protects it. And so if he finds it so important, you should too. Amen? Hallelujah. 
And so however that looks to you, if that means, don't jump over the chairs, okay? All right, listen, we're, this is a Pentecostal church, I know, but uh, if you want to, if, you, if you're able to, then go for it. But, uh, but whatever that looks like to you, if that's singing, if that's raising your hands, I know that that brings a smile to the face of our King. Amen? I want to invite you, if, it, if it's not really in your personality type, to, to outwardly worship. Got news for you. We're, doing, we're going to be doing that in heaven for a very long time together. So, so take a step. Amen. We're going to sing a song we've sang many times before, but I want you to know if you're going through something, God is the same, like I just said a couple minutes ago. Jesus, when he was walking on the earth, healed everyone he saw that he could. The Bible, in fact, says that uh, the books at the time, there was not enough books to fill all the works that he did when he was on earth. Amen? He's the same. Here at the Cause Church, just the, the most recent healing that I, that I know of and remember is we just had somebody healed of dietary intolerances. Meaning, somebody was healed in, healed during worship of gluten intolerance and lactose intolerance. Sometimes we take those things and we say, this is life. I'll just drink lactate. <laughs> I'll, I'll eat gluten-free bread, whatever it may be. Jesus has got another way. Amen. He's the same. Amen. Look to the person next to you and say, he's the same God. somebody you are you answer prayers back 
and you will answer now because you are the same God you are the same you 
on, church, lift your voice in your hands. Would you worship the Lord? Lifted hands is a biblical position to worship. If you're comfortable doing that, do that. But do not let your mouth fall silent right now. Would you praise the Lord God in this place? Worthy.
that thank you, Jesus, one more time. Every voice will sing. Sing, thank you, Jesus, for the blood. Oh, give him thanks. day. God, we thank you that your blood has cleansed us. God, let us never, ever, 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 ever forget what you did for us. God, let it be what everything we do flows from. God, let us never become self-righteous in our own ways that we think that we don't need you. But God, let us live lives that we are completely dependent upon your blood and upon your sacrifice that we realize we know that you know how to show us things. Show us why even more we needed you and why we need you tomorrow and why we'll need you the day that we stand before God. And Jesus, we just thank you for this time of worship. And God, just remind us though that this is, worship is 24-7, 365. God, that we worship you with every thought we have. We worship you with every action we have. We worship you with how we handle our finances. We worship you with whether we love our brothers and sisters. So Jesus, your presence is, Father, is desperately needed in this house. So Jesus, stick around and let not one of our thoughts make you uncomfortable. Jesus, be with us in Jesus' name. Everybody say, can we just thank God one more time? He's so good. He's so good. He's so good. He can be seated. So good. We had a great first service and so glad you're here. Um, before I, I jump in here, I'm just excited about today's service. It's just really even, I've been so convicted preaching first service. I, I got saved again. Um, but uh, real quick, um, I do want to thank every person in this room or that's watching that has helped us with this. Uh, many, if you're new to our church and you don't know what's happening is we recently were given an amazing opportunity, gift from God that we're going to take this whole, actually as far as you can see, this building now. So we're in the process of moving our whole and uh, building a new auditorium at the other end. So in about four to six weeks, it'll change. We won't be in this room on Sundays. We'll be in a room that's, I know, come on. So cool. 
We're going to almost triple our capacity, which is going to be amazing on, on seating. And so um, we still need help, though, to do things. We, I, I've just been amazed at people that have been coming out and just sliding in for an hour. Or yesterday we had another work day. And uh, we, I, it's just so funny. I love meeting many people I didn't even know in their kindness. But one couple I just want to highlight that I'm not going to mention their names, and I'm really not. But they, they just stopped in. They've only been to our church one time. And so he's up in the ceiling taking wires out. And his wife, who just had a baby two weeks ago, wow. two weeks, she said, Pastor, would you care if I just laid my baby in a blanket on the floor and painted? First question, though, I said, how good are you at painting? She said, I painted a lot when I was a kid or when I was younger before. And I said, well, then let's get a brush in your hand. So she painted. And two weeks out of delivering a baby, and I hear that's a traumatic time for women. Um, but come on, ladies, I'm trying to help you. Um, but I just, I'm just so appreciative. I mean, we've got great people coming in. So I just want to say thank you for every person that's come out and helped. And uh, it's like a big, small group we're doing here. Um, I'm getting to know people. And for those of you that are giving, you know, we, we've been blessed with this. And we're going to not, you know, our, our, we've tripled the space while staying the same amount of money. But I do want to encourage you that we still have to pay a large amount every month to pay for our staff and pay for this building. Uh, because of your investment in this building and a place to meet, we had six salvations last Sunday. Come on. So cool. So I would encourage you. And above tithes and offerings, I want to thank everybody that's giving an offering for the house. We're going to keep that tab up because we had said as a board, we would love to be able to pay for all this stuff we're putting into the building uh, and uh, not have to touch our savings. And who thinks that's a good idea? So we're believing. So every dollar you give is appreciated. And I believe the best investment, the best kingdom to invest in is God's kingdom. And so, um, anyway, just keep your eyes open, ears open. There's more stuff coming, and we're going to need some people that are skilled at, at building some stuff here coming up. So, and then more, uh, just a lot of stuff going on. But we're celebrating what God is doing. Amen? And so, thank you from my heart. But I just want to remind you, every person, that you're not doing this for me. You're doing it for God. Amen? It, it's not, it's, I appreciate it, but we're actually building God's kingdom because I've said it, I'm going to keep saying it, his footprints are much bigger than what we can dream right now because why would we go from 14,000 to 38,000 square feet? It's really fast. And so he's got plans that we're going to find out as we go and we're just celebrating what he's doing. And uh, people even brought donuts yesterday in Jesus' name to us and that was just, we knew the Holy Spirit had showed up when donuts and coffee came. <laughs> So anyway, um, secondly, um, this Wednesday, we have, a, um, we're, we're, we have groups. I would encourage you, go on to our events pay on our calendar, and we have so much going on. I mean, there was a group meeting here yesterday of Wonderful Moms Group. It's not called that, but it's a moms group. And so I forgot they were here. I'm like, why are all these kids? And I'm like, oh, moms group, yes. And I'm telling you, I love to see that. I love to see people meeting together. And so go onto our calendar on the website and see when groups meet. There's a young married couples group. We have a, a group tonight meeting, a, a sermon-based group. We have a, Yes, we have two groups meeting tonight. Um, but this is a new one. They're very excited about it. It's on base at Fort Meade. And, and uh, aren't you glad that, that military families are serving Jesus and Meeting, meeting together, so I love that. And uh, anyway, what am I heading it here for? I'm heading a direction here for a reason. Um, oh, this Wednesday, um, we have two other groups. We have Alpha Group that's meeting that is wonderful. It's a great group to help you grow. We have a sermon-based group. But this Wednesday, um, it's like one night only. It's like a concert or something. Um, if, you're, if you're new to our church and you say, I'd really like just to find some information about the church. How does it run? Who works here? What do you believe? Well, I'm doing a one night only uh, this month with Growth Track, which is, will help you. Um, you can come to that if it's just your first Sunday. You're welcome to come to that. If you've been here for a year, you can come to that. What this is, it's an on-ramp to church membership. Now, with saying that, you can come Wednesday, and you never have to join our church. It's just there for you. So it's Wednesday at 7. It's going to be in Building B. It'll be marked. So one thing I would ask you to do if you're coming to that one, go onto our website and register for that. You'll see an event growth track. I just want to know you're coming so I make sure I have a big enough room for it. So um, let me pray and we're going to jump in here. Jesus, thank you. You're so good. God, change our hearts. Bless the people here and those watching in Jesus' name. Amen. So last week we jumped into 1 John and I love the book. I love 1 John. I love this book and I love what, what uh, it just challenged me last week. So today we're going to pick up and read uh, 1 John, pick up at verse 7. We're picking up right where we left last week and we're going to go through about 29, verse 29 today. Um, but, so let's just jump in here 
And uh, last week, remember, we talked about light and darkness. And so how it's important Christians live in the light. If we're not Christians, we, we live in the darkness. And there is potential to step into the darkness from time to time on certain things. And the goal is to stay out of the darkness and don't camp there. Amen? So 1 John 2, 7. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Um, that's what I, I generally use. Here's what it says. And keep in mind, John is writing this to Christians. He's not writing this to the world. So oftentimes, you ever think, oh, the whole Bible is meant for the world. I want to encourage us, all of us together, that every time we read the word, don't look at your wife, don't look at your husband, don't look at your kids, don't look at somebody you don't like. Look at yourself. I feel like there should be more amens to that. Because we all, we need, we all need this because our hearts can go wrong. And so I want to encourage you, don't just... How does this apply to me today? Um, I remember in church growing up, there was a person in the church that every time the pastor would say something, it was a husband and wife, the husband would look at his wife like, and I'm like, that's just wrong, right? And so I don't want to be that person. So it says, dear friends, verse 7, I am not writing a new commandment. This is John writing. I'm not writing a new commandment for you, but rather it is an old one you have had from the very beginning. This old commandment, to love one another is the same message you heard before. Verse 8. Yes, it is also new. Jesus lived the truth of this commandment. Listen to that. And you are also living it. For the darkness is disappearing and the true light is already shining. Now, what he's talking about here is, in John 13, Jesus says this. Here's one thing. I've said this before. I think we need to understand it. I've heard Christians say that Jesus came to soften the gospel. Or soften the he didn't. I've always heard that's Old Testament God, then there's New Testament Jesus. Actually, Jesus drills down deeper. For example, you would see in the Old Testament that if you commit adultery, the act, you've sinned. Jesus says, I'm gonna take you a little step farther. If you think about it, it's the same as if you've done it. So oftentimes we think, oh, Jesus is a little bit softer, he still does it in love. But he's, here is why, Jesus, the Old Testament was designed there to show us we were wrong. When Jesus came, he came to, shut, to deal with a heart issue. You with me? So it's a heart issue. It's one thing for me to say, okay, I know as a believer in Christ, I can never commit adultery on my wife. But it's a, it's a different thing when I know in my heart is changing that I don't want to commit adultery in my wife. You with me? There's a big difference. And so this is, what, this is why we should understand how amazing Jesus is. Because he didn't come down to just build a wall of rules around us. He came down to say, now let's get to business. Let's, let me get inside your heart because I will change your heart so that you don't have to live a legalistic life anymore. Because here's the thing. The scriptures teach us that our hearts are the most deceitful above all things. Anybody agree? Things just come out sometimes. You're like, whoa, wait a minute. Jesus wants to, only through the power of Jesus and the Holy Spirit working, can our hearts be changed. The greatest, the greatest prayer a Christian can pray is get in my heart and change me. Get in my heart. Because, ever, listen, everything in the Bible, every single thing is a heart issue. It goes from what we're going to talk about here in a minute to even tithing is a heart issue with me. If I understand, oh, i got to give to the church, best in the kingdom, but if I realize, wait a minute, it's all God's. I'm giving back to Him in worship. It's a game changer, Right? When I, I go to church, if you go to church, when you let God get in your heart and change it, you go to church because you want to be with other brothers and sisters. You don't go because you're like, did I go to church? Did you see me, God? I went to church. You understand? It's a heart issue. It's saying, God, I want you to get in here, and I want you to get rid of things in my life. I want you to change me so I'm never the same. But what he's talking about here is the commandment, John 13. Jesus, as I referred to about committing adultery, Jesus came to this situation, and what he said is, in the Old Testament, you would see it said to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and your mind, and to love others. Jesus said, okay, let's, let's deal with the heart here a little bit. Let's go deeper. I'm going to tell you to love other Christians the way I loved you. And then you would say, well, Jesus, how did you love me? He would say, I died for you. See the difference? 
It changes everything. It's like a, it's like a, a, a uns, it's, it's like a unselfish denial. It doesn't mean you let people walk over you. But it means that I am going, because I cannot love, I'm going to be honest with you. Can I be honest? Like I lie all the other times. I do not have the capacity in my, in Greg Cooperness, to love you without the Holy Spirit in my life. Let's put it back. So you don't think that you're a bad person. You do not have the capabilities to love me without the Holy Spirit inside you. Why? Because we're messy. We, we're messy. And so this is what he's saying. He's saying we need to love. He said we need to love each other. And we're not, listen, we're not talking about the world. We're talking, non-Christians. We're talking about people you see, people that you pass in their cars that are coming home from other churches today. We don't run the Baptist off the road, right? Some of you may do. Now, I'll take any Presbyterian off. And, no, I'm just joking. I'm just joking. Just joking. I just want to say that. But we're to love each other. And if I get past that and let's say, God, get in my heart. What, what does the Bible say? It says the world will know us by our love. For who? For them? No, for one another. People should be dying to get into the Christian community. Why? Because we love each other. So this is what he says. It says then in verse 9, it says, listen to this. If anyone claims I am living in the light, walking with Christ but hates a fellow believer, that person is still living in darkness. Now, that's a word hate there, but that doesn't just mean like we've said, I hate you. That means that there's just, it could spring from this. If a, let's just say that, you know, we have great musicians and every single person on this team is wonderful and I'm not separate anybody, but Marlon can sing amazingly. And everybody on our team, listen, we have great vocalists, so please don't think I'm separating anybody. And he's probably going to get mad and leave the church because I'm saying this because he's, he's a humble guy. But if I sat in my seat this morning and I started thinking, getting jealous of Marlon because he can sing and I can't sing like that, that's danger. I'm stepping back into darkness. You see what I'm saying? And what happens there, I would never say that I hate Marlon, but something's building. Jealousy, it's the same thing. If I'm jealous of other believers in Christ, if I, if I have a, a motive against them, if I start to really strongly dislike them, and just there's some, it says, you're, if you say you're living in the light, but being that way, you're really in the darkness. You know how I know that? I've been there, I've done it. It says you're still living in darkness. You, you've come out. Maybe you went back, whatever. So love is important. Verse 10 says this. Anyone who loves a fellow believer is living in the light and does not cause others to stumble. Why? Because we're both in the light. I'm encouraging you to keep walking. I'm encouraging you to keep going. But listen to this, verse 11. But anyone who hates a fellow believer, notice that means a.k.a. Christian, is still living and walking in darkness. There's a scripture that says seven things that God hates. One of those is disunity. Somebody that causes dissensions. It's, it's right there with pride. It's right there with lying. So if I am somebody that doesn't love... Listen, if I love my other you, other brothers and sisters, I will never ever attempt to cause disunity in a church body. Does that make sense? It's not there. Why? Because I'm not... Love cancels all that out. Doesn't mean we agree on everything, right? There's people in here that like Krispy Kreme. There's people in here that like Dunkin' Donuts. You Dunkin' people are wrong. You're not saved, but you understand what I'm saying. <laughs> but you understand what I'm saying? It, it, it's a thing of I need to be careful. I need to be so careful and stay in the light because the way that God's kingdom operates is we love each other. I don't agree on everything. I don't agree with everything on my wife. That doesn't mean I don't love her, right? But it's, it's talking, but anyone who hates a fellow believer is still living and walking in darkness. Listen to this. Such a person does not know the way to go, having been blinded by the darkness. I've been, once, it means I saw once, but now I'm blind. That's how dissension, that's how problems within people happen in the church because we start to, our heart's not right. That's why marriage is in. If two people are walking with Christ, one of them or both of them maybe have stepped into darkness. You with me? 
a husband that committed adultery and his wife definitely stepped into to, to the darkness. If two believers have a disagreement over something that's not like your favorite football team or something, and it just really gets angry, even that, there's some, one of us is playing in the darkness. We need to get back in the light and say, God, I need your love in my life so that I don't cause this to happen. You guys with me? Verse 12 says, I'm writing to you who are God's children because your sins have been forgiven through Jesus. That's an amen moment. Your sins have been forgiven. We're God's children. So then verse 13, he starts to list different people. He says, he says I am writing to you who are mature in the faith because you know Christ, who existed from the beginning. I'm writing to you who are young in the faith because you have won your battle with the evil one. You, you've given your heart to Christ. I have written to you who are God's children because you know the Father. I've written to you who are mature in the faith because you know Christ who existed from the beginning. Verse 14, I've written to you who are young in the faith because you were strong. God's word lives in your hearts and you have won your battle with the evil one. Let me just say something here because I think it's important. He's hitting all different groups. The newly saved, the young in faith, the older ones. What he's really getting at here is for us to understand, it is not God's will for us to always stay the same. How many of you have a six-month or younger baby in your home? Nobody has babies that young in this church. Let's just say you have a six-month-old baby, and you go home today, you treat them like a baby, because they're a baby, right? You, you feed them, you, they can't take care of themselves. Put 10 years in their life, if they're still in that state, you're going to be alarmed. Right? Right? What I'm saying is, too many Christians are still drinking milk. Too many. And it, and it happened because we just keep staying there. We keep, we keep hitting the wall, the same thing. Maybe you're battling with the same thing over and over again. And God has given us victory, church. Amen? He gives us deliverance through these things. And so it's always to go from season to season. So when you, get your, when you give your heart to Christ, the young Christians, then it is up to you to buy into this and to begin to follow Christ and want to be. Because here's what happens. If God's love is in you and you've received his love, it's going to draw you close to him. And so what happens is it's everywhere we are, different walks with Christ, all of us in this room, when people get to the place where I have arrived, it's dangerous. Because we are to be growing in what? Relationship, fellowship with Jesus. Last week, remember I talked about fellowship with, with God, the Holy Spirit, and Jesus. Be careful. Let me just give you this caution because I see it happen in my, in my years, and it can happen to any of us. Be careful that you don't ever get to the place where you care more about knowledge of God than, than relationship with him. There's a new trend in churches, and I, I'm, not gonna, I'm not saying this to be unkind, but this is the age it's hitting. Even amongst pastors, even in the assemblies of God that are 30 and under, that think they need to sit around and debate about what does the Bible really mean this? Does this mean this? Can I tell you that's not of God? Because God's word is true. It's not my platform to sit around and debate whether it's true or not or what this really means. It is my role to say, I am saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, I want to grow in my relationship with him. I can, there are people today on their way to hell with more knowledge than I could even begin to debate with them. But if Jesus is not living in their heart and they are not in relationship, you see the difference? I'm not saying we don't learn, but what he's saying here is he's saying there's different to grow. Keep going in your relationship. That's the beauty of following Jesus. That there's every day, I cannot wait to see what happens in my relationship with Jesus today. When I was dating my wife 100 years ago, <laughs> man, I would drive, we didn't, our texting was writing letters. Anybody with me? Three of you are brave enough to say it was you too. And you'd, you'd write them and you'd fold them up real tight. <laughs> and you stick them in your pocket and you'd be like, man, I can't wait to give her this. I'd give it to her. What? Right here's the letter. <laughs> and I'd, I'd, I'd go to, I'd go, I was working about 35 hours a week, taking a full course load in college. And then I'd drive 30 minutes to see her. And I'd be like, oh, I, could, I couldn't wait. What's going to happen? What, what's going to happen now? What, what are you going to do? What, kind, what can we do together? What's going to happen here? And I just can't wait to be with her. You should be so passionate about your relationship, more passionate about your relationship with Jesus than any other relationship you're in. 
Here's why. Because if you are passionate about Jesus, it is only going to grow your relationship as a husband, as a father, as a wife. It's going to change everything. And once you find that, too many people, too many Christians spend so much time trying to find that perfect relationship that's going to... Can I tell you, I've said it before, I'll say it again. I I am 101% because it's biblical between marriage, between a man and a woman. I think it's a gift from God. But that wife cannot fulfill you guys. That That husband cannot. Only Jesus Christ can fulfill you. Then everything else is just icing on the cake. It's growing in that relationship, that fellowship. Verse 15, so he's trying to establish that. Verse 15 says, now here's where it gets serious. And I'm serious, it really convicted me first service. But here's where where it can tend to get quiet sometimes. He says this, now he's talking to Christians. He says, do not love this world nor the things it offers you. Everybody said, ouch. He says, do not love the world nor the things it offers you. Listen to this. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. The world in this case does not mean the creation. God is the most amazing creator. There's nothing. There's only one creator. His name is He's God. You look at the beach. You look at the mountains. You look at the trees. You whatever. His creation is unbelievable. But we're talking about the world system, we'll talk about it more in a minute, that is against what God's plan is. And so what it it says are things that can pull us away. We have the love of God and we have the love of the world. God says, if you love me first and you seek me first, Matthew 6, with everything you've got, I will bless you. I will pour into your life like you've never been poured into. But unfortunately, we live in this world and even Christians get sidetracked into, I love Jesus, but I also love the world. This is the writer here is saying to the church, do not love the world nor the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father. So if I am loving the world, I'm exchanging God's love and saying, I don't want your love, but I want, I'm going to love this. You say, Pastor, how do I know if I love the world more? What do you think about most? What do you go to bed thinking about? What do you wake up thinking about? We say all the time, we sing, I love God. I do it. I love God. But then we can find ourselves falling right back into loving the world. Because it's deceptive, right? It, it tricks us. It's an exchange of things. And we'll talk about more, more about this in a moment. But I want us to understand that what he's saying is do not love the world. Because listen, the scripture, we're not of this world. We're in it, but we're not of it. So what happens is, I think there's often times, I, how, do you, how do you look at things like this? I would say this. And I'm not saying your whole life, but this week, and I'm, I'm saying this not to be unkind, but it's, it's a check for all of us. If you did not read your Bible this week, I would say you love the world more this week than you love God. If you did not pray, then you love the world more than you love God. And see, feelings aren't even attached to it. I would say, here's another thing, and this convicted me. I said it on the fly this morning, and it got me. If I watched more TV this week than I spent with God, then I love the world a little bit more this week than I love God. Does that make sense? That convicted me. Because I will do everything within my ability to be with what I love. You with me? And so I make choices. I might not choose it, but we've got to be so careful not to fall into that trap because because the enemy, he's deceiving. He tricks us. John is just saying here, he's saying, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love others as I have loved you. God has loved you. And so we've got to be careful because the world is always calling out for us, right? Right? It's, it's so true. Let me read on here. I'm going to come back and show you this. In verse 16, listen to this. It says, for the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure. 
a craving for everything we see and pride in our achievements and possessions. Listen to what it says. These are not from the Father, but are from this world. So basically what I think it's important for us to understand, for me to understand, that if I am choosing... If I am loving the world more than I'm loving God, but I'm saying I'm a Christian, I am committing adultery on God. Does that make sense? I'm choosing. But why? Because if I told my wife, if I said, listen, babe, I love you with everything that's in me, you're, but I never spend time with her. I never, there's never anything drawing me to be with her. And I just am away from her all the time. There's clearly something wrong. She's going to get mixed signals. But if I am completely saturated and in hot pursuit of God, and I say, God, I want, I want you to guard me against sin. Listen, and it's not always just things that we look at. We look at sins all the time and we say, okay, sexual immorality, this person committed adultery or whatever. What about the things that aren't necessarily wrong? But what if I am, it says, for the world only offers a craving for physical pleasure, craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements. What if it is, I am so drawn into the pursuit for more money? My career. And, and it's just, it's pulling you away. It's like, it's like, because what happens then, I'm not saying you're not a follower of Christ, but what I'm saying then is I am loving the world more than I'm loving God. Because Matthew 6.33 says what? Seek Him first. And all the, and I under, listen, I understand all of us need to work. We all need to pay our bills. But it all goes back to the heart issue. You with me? It's the heart issue. It, it's the heart. It's like, what is it? What is in me? Where is my passion? If I am passionate about something, I will do every single thing I can to put myself in position to receive the, from that thing that I love, be in the presence. Oftentimes we... Oftentimes we, um, I'll say that in a minute. It says, for the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from the world. Listen to this. Here's why the writer's saying this. This world is fading away. It's fading away. And it says, along with everything that people crave, what are the things we crave? The pride in our achievements. All these three things that it lists. Go back to that if you don't mind for verse 16, just for a moment. All these things, a craving for everything we see, pride in our achievements, a craving for physical pleasure. All these things are fading right now as we speak. And that's why he's saying, listen, don't, 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 don't fall in love with these things because you're falling in love with something that is fading away as time marches on. He said, fall in love with the one who will live forever, the one who has you right now, the one who will keep you, the one who will, you'll spend eternity with the things of him. Stop being, stop falling into this stupid pit. The world will chew you up and spit you out and we've got to be careful because some people in this room, when we talk about finances, and I say this a lot, but I think it all goes back to the heart because oftentimes there's this bracket. I hear this a lot. People that are, that are not, so, not wealthy will say, well, only the rich people have problems with pursuit of material things. That is such a lie. Such a lie. What, it's in every single person. There can be that default setting to want more. It's, it's not a respecter of, of how much money you have now. It is, it is, it's in the heart. It's in the heart. And I celebrate the next person that, that uh, I celebrate the next person as much as with the person as much if you're successful. And I know great Christian people, men and women, that are very successful and, and that God has used them in great ways. But we've got to be careful not to get stuck in that rut, that, that rut of, of ch just chasing after material things. All the, all the disciples were poor. Matthew, he, a little bit more. But you understand, they didn't have a lot. But yet they were so happy. Why? Because they were in relationship with Jesus. It's a heart condition, church, right? It's the, it's the heart. It's like all these things are fading away. I can tell you, I just did a service a few weeks ago for a wonderful young lady. Uh, a celebration of life service. And I, I've done... Tons of those services. None of the stuff that we choose to pursue and go for, we take with us. Not, not one of them. It's all left here. 
And so why not pursue the one thing that carries all through eternity, church? Amen. We just choose, pursue him. And listen, I'm not telling everybody to go home and quit your jobs. I'm not telling you wrong if your bank account's built up. I'm, you know, I, I put stuff in it, it, to, to prepare for the future. But I'm telling you, never let these things get a hold of your heart. Don't fall in love with those things. Let your passion be for Jesus. Let your passion be for Jesus. Verse 17, this is why all this world is fading away along with everything that people crave. But listen to this. Anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. Verse 18, dear children, the last, listen to this, the last hour is here. I want to camp here for a bit. Let me just, let me just say this, and I know people. In these times, the disciples thought that Jesus' return was at any second. He said, be ready. One of the greatest deceptions of Satan today is to convince us that Jesus is not coming back any second. Why does he do that? Because he doesn't want us to be ready. I'm 26 years old now. I'm 55 years old now. And I don't get caught down the path of end time stuff and just concentrate on it. But I'm telling you this, with everything that's in me, you can ask anybody in my age bracket, I feel like that this world, the last hour has come. I feel like it's been a fast forward in the last 20 years like I've never seen in my life. So if they were saying the last hour is here, we're in the last seconds. And let me just say this to you. You say, Pastor, you don't know what you're saying. Maybe I don't, but I'm telling you, Jesus is coming back. He's coming back for a spotless church. So if you say you, you live another 30 years on this earth and Jesus doesn't come back which I don't see how it's possible he won't, personal opinion, in that time frame, and you've lived for Christ and you pursued him with everything you've got and you die without seeing the second return of Christ, what have you lost? What have you lost? But it's, he says, dear children, here's one of the reasons I'm writing for you. The last hour is here. You have heard, it, you've heard that the Antichrist is coming and already many such antichrists have appeared. From this we know that the last hour has come. A lot of people get confused about the. I'll talk about the antichrist and the many antichrists. The antichrist spirit is all over the earth right now. What is the antichrist spirit? The antichrist spirit is against God. It's against God. Would we agree that it's here? Now let me just tell you, some people get confused about what the Antichrist will look. And I hear people say, well, this person's him, this person's him, or whatever. I don't get caught up in all that. But here's one thing that I will guarantee you that will be a characteristic of him. He will not come out and say that he hates God or he's against Jesus. Why? Because the word Antichrist actually can mean something like instead of. Instead of. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not a Christian. But what happens, in order for the, the Antichrist to come forward, the Antichrist spirit has to be on the earth. What's here? Okay, it was here then. And he says it's the last hour. But what we've got to understand, before we start thinking things, we think the Antichrist is going to come out with a, with a pitchfork and a red rubber suit. That's not the way the devil looks anyway. Why? Because he's dece he deceives. When the Antichrist comes out, he's going to be about all about bringing unity I can change everything and bringing people together so it'll sound good to those that are in the darkness. But it'll sound good to those also if you're not in touch with Christ and walking with Christ and part of a church community. And see, one of the things we've got to understand about the last hour, and I think this is so true, I'm not telling you that Jesus is coming back tomorrow or the next day, but what I am saying to you today, that Jesus could come back at any second because the signs are their church. Earthquakes. I remember hearing about an earthquake like every three months or four months. Now, I don't even keep track of them anymore. You look at what's happening in Israel today. Different nations are coming against it. Listen, biblical prophecy is being fulfilled right now. And we can look at it and go, hmm, so far, God's 100%. Right? You see all these things happening and you start hearing things about one world government and all this. And well, you know, Listen, just be careful. 
We need to be careful. That's why we need each other. And what happens here, and what I want us to get at this morning is, you think about it, if a major disaster happens today in this nation, if people really start to think, oh my goodness, Jesus could come back at any time. But let's just say that there's a terrorist attack and thousands of people get killed. I would promise you with everything about it that this church would be filled if we had a prayer meeting tomorrow night. If we get bombed by Iran today, I would, have a, I would not be able to, we would not be able to contain the people in this church. We need to be Christians that don't need to be motivated in a passion for Christ when bad things happen, but daily life. You with me? It's, it's like, I'm not going to just, listen, the, the Bible, I believe he's there when you run to him. But I want to be people that are ready. I want to be people, why? Because I want to love my brothers and sisters. And when things start happening, that's why I say, how can Christians, when the world is crumbling all around us, how can we stand firm in this crazy world? Remember, he says, don't fall in love with it. You can look at Hollywood today and all the glamour and all the glitz and all the stars having all the money. Listen, at the end of the day, they're going to stand before God. And all that stuff they have, you can be in this room and you can work hard and have $3 in your bank account not knowing what's going to happen. But if you have Christ, you're rich and they're poor, right? You have everything. And it's coming to this place where I just want to be a church that that in a group of people like God, that we're passionate about God. We don't need another 9-11 to happen to draw me to Christ. Man, I'm going to pray for things like that before they happen to stop them from happening. It's a passion for him that this world is not going to pull me aside. If you wait and pray for the election on November 6th or whatever, we've lost it, right? We need to be people that are praying for this nation every single day. Why? Because we're passionate about who God is and what he offers to this world. So he says the last hour is here. You've heard that the Antichrist is coming And already many such antichrists have appeared. From this we know the last hour has come. So other antichrists have come in. Not the antichrist. But basically, do you know that I could be used in an antichrist spirit if I'm against God? If I start offering something that is opposite of what God has, I'm operating and influenced by the antichrist spirit. But he says, but but he says, these people left our churches, but they never really belong with us. Otherwise, they would have stayed with us. When they left, it proved that they did not belong to us. Verse 20, it says, but you are not like that. I love this. He turns it then. He says, but you're not like that. For the Holy One has given you His Spirit, and all of you know the truth. Let that sink in. He's saying to the church, you know the truth. Do you understand that if you, we look at other people that just got saved, And we gauge our maturity against them by this. We say, well, they're still struggling with sin, so it's okay for me to. No, 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 no. I'm farther along. Right? If if six people got saved last week, I'm not more saved than them. God doesn't love me more than them. But I've been serving Christ long enough that more is expected of me. Why? Because I'm farther along. You understand what I'm saying? Because I know more of the truth. I know more of what God is and what he wants to do in my life. Now it's for me to move on past drinking milk all the time and get up so that I can go out and make an impact for God. I can show people what it means to follow Christ. I can be in this relationship with Christ. It's not me going back and what if every time when me and Heather, we dated for three years, every time I showed up at her house to pick her up, I went to the door and I went, hey, I'm Greg Cooper and uh, I'd like to take you out on a date. She's, she goes on a date. I take her back, drop her off. The next night I come up, hey, I'm Greg. I'm glad to meet you. She'd be like, you're, you're a lunatic. Some of us are like that. No, no, no. Keep going. There's more. You're missing out. He's got so much for you. Verse 21. You guys still with me? He says, so I'm writing to you, not because you don't know the truth, but because you know the difference between truth and lies. We should know the difference between truth and lies now. Now, there's still some things that we're learning, right? But we should all be putting ourselves in position and learning When the Antichrist spirit comes into the church or we see it, we should be like, that's a lie. And we got to, here's the problem. If I love the world over Christ, I am much more susceptible to receiving that lie than if I'm with Christ in the light. You with me? Verse 22, and it says, and who is a liar? 
Anyone who says that Jesus is not the Christ, anyone who denies the Father and the Son is an Antichrist. So they don't believe Jesus came in the flesh. They don't believe he was God. They don't believe he was God's Son. That clears all that up. Verse 23, anyone who denies the Son doesn't have the Father either, but anyone who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. That's why we must acknowledge, Jesus, I believe you are the Son. I believe that you're the only path to God. So here's a way to test when you're going through your day. All religions are not the same. Christianity is the only religion that says there's one way. That's through Jesus Christ. As him, God, he's God, he is the Son. And there's forgiveness is found only in his death on the cross. His resurrection life is found. Amen? Verse 24, so you must remain faithful to what you have been taught from the beginning. Listen to that. If you do, you will remain in fellowship. Listen to this, with the Son and Father. So what we've all, wherever we are, if you're here today and you're not a Christian, we're going to give you an opportunity in a minute. But what he's saying here is, okay, everybody that's Christians, the mature, the newly saved, the young in Christ, I'm putting you in a group here. That, that pretty much encompasses all believers. He's saying, remain faithful to what you've been taught. What does that mean? That doesn't mean everything I say. What that means is, that means what you've been taught with God's Word. Not the flashy stories I say or that I like Krispy Kreme. What does God's Word say? He said, remain faithful to it. We know what faithful means, right? It means that I'm, I'm there. I pledged to my wife, oh my goodness, 34 years ago, that I remain faithful to her. I get up every morning and choose her to be my wife. That means every day I'm going to get up and I'm going to be faithful to Jesus as my Lord and I'm going to be faithful to His teachings. And I'm going to love others and I'm going to love God. I might mess up sometimes, but you know the grace of God says, get up, Greg. Get up. That's the beauty in it. You must remain faithful to what you've been taught from the beginning. Listen to this. This is conditional. If you do, you will remain in fellowship with the Son and the Father. That means that now I'm only saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. But for me to remain in fellowship with Him, it's on me. It's on me. Just like my relationship with my wife is not just all on her. It's up to me to be like, to, to be around her, to make an effort. I have to do my part. I didn't do any part in being saved. But it says, I want you, he's saying, I want you to remain faithful. I want you to be there. Then verse 25 says this. And this, in this fellowship, we enjoy the eternal life he promised us. If you're in Christ today, you have eternal life. Okay? But if I break off fellowship, relationship with God, I can lose it. It's conditional. Verse 26 says, I'm writing these things to warn you about those who want to lead you astray. Talking about the Antichrist. Verse 27, but you have received the Holy Spirit. Somebody should say amen to that. And he lives within you so that you don't need anyone to teach you what is true. What this means is, I should be in such fellowship with the Holy Spirit that when I read the Bible, it just lines up. I'm like, oh. I should be in such fellowship with the Holy Spirit that when I, it doesn't mean you never say, I'm not listening to any preacher ever again. I'm never going to a class. That's not what it means. It means that you should be in such close fellowship with the Holy Spirit that when you hear messages, when you hear, the, it just confirms what the Holy Spirit's speaking in your heart. You with me? So somebody might say, well, what if the Holy Spirit tells me something different than the Bible says? It wasn't the Holy Spirit. No other way to dice it and slice it. What if the pastor tells me something that the Holy Spirit told me? What's, let God's word be in the middle. What's God's word say? You with me? Because you've got to understand, I've had people come to me and say, I feel like God's telling me to leave my wife. Like, mm, that's not the Holy Spirit. You with me? It's easy fix here, right? So we've got to be careful with that. And it says, for the Spirit teaches you everything you need to know. And what he teaches is true. It is not a lie. Verse 27, so just as he taught you, listen to this, remain in fellowship with him. What does that mean? I'm staying. Today, my wife is, she said, I'm, I'm staying. I'm going to remain in relationship, fellowship with my wife today. I choose that. Today, I'm going to remain in fellowship with God. 
I'm going to walk with them. I'm going to listen to them. I'm going to be in that fellowship we talked about last week, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I'm going to walk with Jesus. I'm going to do what he did because he said I can do things he does if I trust in him. I can't, I'm not going to die. I can't do that for him, for the, for the salvation of people. He did that. I'm going to listen to the Holy Spirit's leading. That's relationship. That's fellowship. Remain means stay. And last verse, it says, and now, dear children, listen to this, remain in fellowship with Christ. He just comes right back and says it again. So that when, listen, here's why. So that when he returns, the rapture of the church, the second coming, you will be full of courage and not shrink back from him in shame. I jokingly said this first service, and I'll cover it really quick just to give you an idea. Um, If I am in love with the world, I will shrink back in shame when Christ returns. Sorry. Love you, man. If I am, if I am, if I am in a love affair with the world or the things of the world, I'm going to shrink back in shame. If I am in love with Jesus, I'm still living in the world. I'm still a good dad. I'm still a good pastor. I'm still doing the things I need to do. When I hear Jesus is coming back, I can just be like, God, come quickly. If you're here today and you fear and you don't like to hear about the return of Christ, perhaps you're in love with the world. Is that fair? I've been there. Perhaps you're not ready, but also perhaps you just like the world. You just love the world too much. He's like, I don't want to leave this. Because listen, if you love this world, you are not going to love heaven. Because it's a whole different system. He said, remain in fellowship with Christ so that when he returns, you'll be full of courage and not shrink back. I remember years ago, I used to be so worried about the end return because I grew up, some of you know this, I say it a lot, in the age of the rapture movies that would scare me to death. Thief in the night, distant thunder, and we showed them on Sunday nights on the old reels. And I'd sit through them and I'd be like, why are my parents making me sit through this? And I remember one time, I was growing up, I was in a church that literally said, if you go to a movie theater, you, you're, it's dangerous grounds. Now, there's some truth to that. It's what you watch, right? But I was going to see Benji. The little dog. The dog. I love Benji. I was seven. And so my mom said, it, it, it's from 1975. Still to this day, I'll tell you a funny story. A couple weeks ago, I talked about it. So Heather goes on YouTube and brings the theme song up. I'm not lying to you. I am crying like a baby one, one second in. Because I, rem- I just used to remember, he's a little dog running along the road with no home. It's so sad. Tough guys cry. But my mom said, you want to go see Benji? I went, no. Because if Jesus comes back, I'm going to miss it. So I was kind of like, God, it's just Benji. So I was kind of walking in like, what if he comes back here? I'm going to hell. If I just... that, was a, that was a little bit over the line teaching. Are you with me? But I want to live my life. In an hour from now, four hours from now, when I'm home alone and my wife's not around and none of you are watching me or talking to me, I want to live my life that if Jesus comes back, I won't shrink back and be embarrassed. I'll say, I've been waiting. I've been waiting. Right? I've been waiting. And I'm not saying that for anybody in this room to beat yourself up because we all, we trip up sometimes. We do stupid stuff. But that's the beauty of going back to God and saying, God, please forgive me. Help me not to do this again. He loves you so much. He restores you, gets you back on your feet. But it's living in a world because if I love the world, I'm not ready. I'm going to shrink back. But man, if I'm in love with Jesus while still living in the world, but he's my first priority, I can say, Jesus, if you come back tonight, I'm ready. If you come back in the middle of the night tonight, I'm ready. If you come back a week from today, I'm going to be ready. I'm going to stand there full of courage. Why? Because I'm trusting in his son that he saved me. I'm going to stop right there if you stand. Verse 29, you can read it later. I'm just going to stop right there. I'm going to ask the prayer team to come up. You might be here this morning and say, you know what, Pastor Greg, I don't know Jesus. I don't, I don't know Jesus. I'm not in relationship with him. But boy, today, I, I'd love to give my heart to him. Maybe you once were. Maybe you, you just slipped back in the darkness. Listen, it's happened to me. You just slide back in there. Oftentimes, I'm not knowing it. 
But you'd say, man, today I'd love to give my heart. Last week we had six salvations. So powerful. Six people. But if you're in this room today and you say, you know what, Pastor Greg, I'd love to give my heart to Jesus today. I'd love to come back. That's me. I'm just going to ask you to close your eyes just for a moment. If that's you, in the count of three, just slip your hand up. And we're going to pray together as a group. And the Bible says you will be saved. So in the count of three, either for the first time or you're coming back, if you just slip your hand up and say, Pastor, please pray for me today. I want to give my heart to Jesus. If that's you, slip your hand up. Anybody at all in this room? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I've seen three hands. If there's a fourth, please, I don't want to miss you. I'm not going to point you out. No fear. You're just about to meet the one that loves you like nobody you've ever experienced. Thank you. I see your hand. Thank you. Wow. I love to see four people respond to relationship with Jesus. How powerful is that? So you four that raised your hand, maybe five, I'm not sure. If you just repeat this prayer, this is just that, this is just proclaiming what you believe about Jesus today. And the Bible says when you proclaim this, you will be saved. Amen. So can we all, those of you in the room that are already believers, you know the, you know how we do it. We just repeat it with these people because we want to support them because we celebrate them. But if you're in this room and you're not ready to do this, I am not tricking you. Don't say the words. I totally respect that. So can we just pray this prayer with these four wonderful people this morning? Just repeat after me. Say, Jesus, come to you today needing a Savior. I admit that I'm a sinner. And I ask that you would forgive me for all my sins. I believe that you are God's Son. And you paid the price for all my sins on the cross. And from this day, I receive you to be my Savior and Lord. And I turn and follow you. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we celebrate those four people? So cool. So cool. So awesome. So cool. So I, I, we're going to do a little altar time here. I'm sorry we're a couple minutes behind, but I just really think God wants to touch some hearts. If you prayed that prayer right now, when you leave this place today, if you would just take a moment, fill one of those cards out. Madison will talk about it in a minute. And just let us know you, you recommitted or you gave your heart to Christ and drop it at the Connect Center. We, we want to give you a Bible and a book because we want to be with you on this journey because this is the biggest decision you've ever made in your life. And we don't want you to be alone. We don't want you to be alone. We want to see God work in your life and, and just begin to grow. So please don't leave this place without stopping off and getting a Bible. We have a one-to-one program and groups that we'd love. Alpha Wednesday night would be a great starting point to come out to. It's seven. Great. But right now in this moment, I want to take a couple minutes. But I, I just want you to do this today to God. And if everybody can just close their eyes. If, if you're here this morning, you say, Pastor, God's got his finger on my heart over something. I don't know what it is. I'm not going to ask you. I just want you to acknowledge not to me. But you acknowledge to God this morning, God, your finger's on my heart. I want you to know that I, I see it, I feel it, I know it. If you just slip your hand up to God this morning and say, here I am, God, your, your hand's on my heart. It's awesome. Man, God loves people that'll just open their hearts to more of him. So we're going to go through, Pastor Andrew's going to lead us in this song. And we have two wonderful people here. If you're here this morning and you need special prayer, um, man, let one of these people pray for you. They'd love to pray for you healing, whatever. If you want to come to the altar during this song, man, the altar's open. I would encourage you, if you did raise your hand, don't worry about what anybody says. Just bring it late at the altar. Jesus meets you. Amen? He meets you. And then uh, we'll close out in a minute and we'll do some announcements. But let's take a couple minutes and just say, God, what do you want to do here today? Amen? Thank you guys so much. Please come. Take the 
this life in rhythm. This heart is now.
can have it all. Every voice in this place, every part of me. Take this life, Jesus. Take this life and breathe. This heart that is new. So you can have it all. To more of you, Jesus. Every part of my world. And take this life and breathe Jesus, this heart that is now This heart that is now This heart that is now yours, this heart that is now yours, is all I need is you, is all I need is you, Lord, it's you, Lord. All I need is you. It's all I need is you, Lord. It's you, Lord. All I need is you. It's all I need is you. Somebody's got a sacrifice to make. I said that all I need is you. Oh, it's all I need is you, Lord. It's you. I lay it all down because all I need is you. Oh, it's all I need is It's all I need is you. Oh, it's all I need is you, Lord. It's you, Lord. All I need is you. It's all I need is you. same 
you stay the same. Everything else has to change because of you. I thank you, Jesus, that you have called us to, to higher places. Higher places. I thank you, Jesus, that you take care of our sin consciousness by saying, I paid for it all. Where can you go now? Take my hand. Look at where we're going to go. Holy Spirit, guide us in taking the hand of our King to not stay the same. Let tomorrow be a new day, a fresh anointing. Hallelujah. I thank you for these people, Lord, that are hungry for you. They are knocking at the door, Lord, swing it open. They're calling you, answer, Lord. Hallelujah. And let us together as the cause church see you, experience you, meet you in brand new ways, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for salvation that we experience today in this room. There is a party in heaven going on. Let us not take for granted the fact that on a consistent basis we see miracles and salvations. Holy Spirit, work our hearts. Bring us to the next level, every single one of us. We love you, and we're so thankful for you, Lord Jesus. We bless your name, and we pray. Amen and amen. Can you lift up a shout of praise? Thank you so much for spending your Sunday with us. This has been just amazing time, just getting to worship with you and be in community and fellowship with one another. My name is Madison. I am the youth pastor here at The Cause. And again, we are so glad you spent your Sunday with us. I have a couple announcements to share with you before you go on your way today. There are three ways you can give here at The Cause Church. You can give online at our website. You can give in person. There's offering envelopes on the seat backs in front of you. Fill it out and drop it off on your way out. Or you can also scan the QR code on the screen. And we are just so thankful for how you are investing, not just into this church, but into God's kingdom. We see the this, this money, these tithes and offerings go out to missionaries, go out to reach the gospel all over the world. And so we are just so thankful for how you are giving and um, seeing how God is using you to play a part. A couple other announcements on the back of the connect, or I'm sorry, the connect card. It's sitting in the seat back in front of you. You can fill that out. If this is your first Sunday with us, we want to say hello. We want to meet you. We want to give you a special gift. So fill out the front of that, drop it off at the connect center. And then on the back of that card, that's where you can let us know if maybe today you gave your life to Christ. Maybe you're looking to get into a connect group, or maybe you have a prayer request. We would love to pray with you about those things. So fill out the back of that connect card drop it off at the Connect Center on your way out and somebody will be reaching out to you this week to give you some more information with that. And then a couple events are coming up this month. The weather is getting nice and it's awesome. Yeah, I love it. And so next Sunday, everybody say next Sunday, is our church picnic and we do not want you to miss it. We're going to go and meet at Savage Park around 4 o'clock, and we're just going to have fun. We're going to play some volleyball, cornhole. We're going to grill and have some food. And so come out and join in with fellowship. This is the perfect time to bring maybe your neighbor with you to just join and have fun with one another. And listen, we're still looking for a couple of people to help us with setting up and to grill. And so if you love to grill, come on out, and we would love to have you help us. Or if you have a big truck and can haul some things we would love for you to be able to help us haul some things over to the park so go onto our website um, and click on events and you can look and see what we need help with and register on there but we are just so excited and looking forward to having a great time next Sunday and then last but not least where are my ladies at 
Yeah, I get excited. The last Saturday of the month, April 27th, we are going to be having a coffee and canvas. And so what this means is we're going to get together, enjoy some coffee, enjoy some tea, and we're going to do some painting projects, okay? And so we're going to have some fun. It's going to be a great time. And so make sure you go on to the events, register for that today, bring a friend. And if you have any questions, you can stop at the event table on your way out today, but make sure you go and register for that today. It's been an awesome some time with you guys this morning. Let me pray over you one more time before you go today. Dear Jesus, we are so excited for what you are doing in our lives. God, I thank you for all the salvations this morning. I thank you for what you are doing in this church. God, I pray that as we leave here today, we would take these words with us and that you would be with us the rest of this day, the rest of this week. God, we thank you, and I pray that you would bless these people as they head out, head out today. And thank you, God, in Jesus' name, amen. Have a great Sunday. Hold on, hold on.